Um, so just to introduce myself, um, I'm an artist. I've been working in performance for the past 20 years. Um, in the 1990s, I was involved in the music scene, and here's me in my microphone skirt, but I performed in many different nightclubs in Britain and Europe. Um, in the uh, 90s, I went on to make a series called Connotations, a series of fictional performance documents that were photographed over a week, but suggested that they'd been made over um, uh, four years. Um, at the bottom there, you can see the uh, diesel fuel gauge, and that's from a piece called Milton Keynes Vertical Horizontal, uh, in which we drove a coach around the road grid system in Milton Keynes until it ran out of diesel, um, and that lasted for 39 hours, uh, not continuous driving because we kept getting off to go um, and buy food and things like that. And then more recently, at the top, in the top corner there, um, uh, a piece uh, that's part of a work called Domestique, which is part of a bigger work that goes under the uh, title of Facadism, um, a series of pieces about facades, either human faces or building facades, and thinking about how we operate as flesh within capitalism. Um, today, I'm going to speak about two projects. Firstly, my novella, Common, uh, which was written in the summer of 2011 and published in 2013. Um, and my work with the art activist collective Liberate Tate and our endeavours to get Tate to drop its sponsor, uh, BP. So first, I became self-appointed artist in residence in the City of London in the spring of 2011, and here's my card. Um, and I kind of made the card as a joke to begin with, um, and then um, the book followed. <laughs> Uh, but I had been working previously in the City of London. Um, and this is a capitalist anonymous meeting that we held. Uh, I held with artist Andrea Mason in the City of London in 2009. Um, and we created a space for people to come and confess their capitalist tendencies. And um, we, we, we wanted to reach out to bankers at this point, at this moment in time, but we didn't really get many bankers, so it was just us and our friends. Um, and we realized that we should have probably called it Neoliberals Anonymous. Um, anyway, we ran it like an AA meeting. Um, and uh, Andrea and I have both been to kind of like look at AA meetings and work out how to run it. Um, and we, uh, we actually um, did the confessional in the meeting. So I, I, di I did the confessional myself as an artist um, and it was very, very interesting. We leafleted the city prior to this, and we tried to get the bankers to come and join us. Um, and we saw it as um, kind of an outreach to bankers, uh, the people that often patronize us as artists. We wanted to help them back. Um, and it was part of a festival which was called uh, Crash, a post-capitalist A to Z, that took place in the city of London. And it wasn't an officially organized festival, but it was a series of um, hacks into the city organized by a group called the Laboratory of Insurrectory Imagination. Um, and everyone was unofficial. And this, this performance was very interesting for me in that as I was kind of preparing for it and thinking about it, I kind of researched a lot about the different kinds of spaces that this could happen in the city. Um, there were, uh, mainly which were kind of very cheap rentals, such as the pub or maybe a church that we could have used to hold these meetings in, but actually uh, realized, coming to kind of uh, do these meetings, that they needed to be in a public space. They needed to be kind of invisible and not kind of behind closed doors. Um, and so we held the meetings on the steps of the Royal Exchange in the City of London. In a, in a public place, which itself is a piece of private land. And um, I guess that we held them over three lunchtimes, and all the way through, we were constantly aware that we might have got move, moved on at any point. Um, but inevitably, I think, uh, like with many of these things, we don't. And actually, people um, absorb quite a lot of activity uh, within their daily lives. So in the summer of 2011, I wrote Common, and Common documents a day as self-appointed artist in residence in the city of London. And it was written during the crash um, and the riots of the summer of 2011. 
and I handed in the manuscript to the publishers five days before Occupy. And it's very interesting because the book itself traces a line between the three stock exchanges in the city of London, the London Metal Exchange, um, the uh, previous, the Royal Stock, Ex uh, the Royal Exchange that you just saw previously, and the London Stock Exchange. Um, so um, I spent lots of time in the city of London, um, and I live very near to the city, so I used it as a reference library, going in and out of the city and observing it, and then withdrawing and writing the book. And in the book, I talk about the global commons, about ecology, economics, and capitalism. Um, and I wanted to make uh, very, very clearly make a link between the economic crash and uh, uh, ecological devastation that's happening at this moment in time. There was a lot of talk about uh, economics, but nothing about uh, what's happening with the environment. Um, the, uh, the book documents a series of protests, accidentally actually, um, that occur um, in the run-up to Occupy. So it includes an NHS protest um, against cuts in which people staged a die-in uh, in one of the streets in the city of London. Um, it documents the G20 protests and climate camp um, also in the city of London in 2010. Um, and a commemorative protest against the police killing of Il Ian Tomlinson also in the same year. Um, it includes uh, information about the riots that happened at that time. And I wrote Common into the dark I didn't know what I was writing, and I wrote it in eight weeks, and it took me a year to get over writing it, just that kind of feat of drawing that information out and of writing from within a crisis where actually I couldn't actually get any sense of what was really happening on the streets of the city. Um, I made performances in the book to generate narrative. So there's one performance where I rub banks. I make uh, rubbings of banks. There's another performance in which I wedge myself inside crowds of people as they go to work. I also document performances in the City of London. So um, I write about the performances of, of traders at the London Metal Exchange at the end of that week in 2011, where their bodies are really wrought. They're kind of um, at the end, um, and they're trading, and they're trading in this space, and it was absolutely spectacular to watch. Um, and um, I also write about a fictional performance in a cabaret called The Crisis Cabaret, where an observational text written about a banker gets transformed into an act where he uh, performs as bonus the banker clown. Um, so I'm going to read um, just uh, one of the first uh, chapters from Common. Um, and this, in a way, gives you a sense of how I'm talking about uh, public and private space. My alarm rings. It is 4.30 a.m. I can hear the birds singing, and it is starting to get light. I get up, shower, and have some breakfast before packing a bag for my first day as self-appointed artist-in-residence in the city of London. The city of London is close to my home. I can see its skyline from my kitchen window. Why self-appointed artist in residence, you may ask? A deliberate ploy not to be beholden to any form of power, financial or other, I might answer. Being employed by the city or a bank to act as an artist in residence would not be an equal relationship. By self-appointing, I give myself agency to act independently of the city and its inherent values. A self-appointed artist needs tools, so I pack a digital camera, MP3 recorder, sketchpad, pencils, a set of watercolours, some sandwiches, a flask and a dress, just in case. I bicycle the half mile from my flat in Whitechapel to the City of London. By 5.34am, I am outside the Royal Exchange, with just two minutes to spare before sunrise. While I wait for the sun to rise, nothing much happens, lazy, this is dawn a mixture of pink and yellow artificial street light, an azure blue sky, the ratio of which constantly changes until daylight is reached. I'm very keen to get started in my new job, but find that I am not alone. There are other people here in my square mile of prime studio. Van drivers are parked and making deliveries of anything from toiletries to food. Security guards and cleaners make up the rest of the population an equal mix of male and female, this predominantly migrant workforce invisibly protects and cleans the offices, stairwells and atriums for a minimum wage. 
By 7 a.m., these service industry workers are already on their way home as most city workers begin to arrive. On the streets, a clear economic division of labour between the poorly and excessively paid reveals itself. Looking down at the pavement, I see insects, crepuscular friends twitching their claws and wings in the dawn, preparing for a new day. According to a very quick pseudo-calculation based on the square metre of ground in front of me, the number of insects in the city of London could easily match its workforce. Many of the insects here are members of the resistance. They shadow and spy on traders day and night. It is commonly thought that the best spies in the insect world are the earwigs and spiders. Butterflies are more, most far-sighted, but their flamboyant wings are a disadvantage and often give them away. The insect spy's most important assets are antennae, wings, and compound eyes. Other insect spy skills include stinging and biting and cutting. Those living in colonies are the most self-organized. Being killed by fly sprays, swatted, or eaten by another insect are some of the risks that insect spies face on a daily basis. And because of this, they often die before being debriefed. Insects use a system of buzzwords learnt from the banking sector to communicate important information. Key phrases include debug, long tail, and cockroach problems. Cockroach problem is my favourite as it describes a situation where one piece of bad news is followed by even more bad news. Like having cockroaches, a company with a cockroach problem can always expect more bad news to turn up shortly. Barely visible to the eye, the insects know how to make their way around the square mile undetected, flying into boardrooms, crawling into offices through air vents, and hiding inside bags and coats. Have you ever heard the expression fly on the wall and wondered where it came from? Here, of course. Some insects possess natural stripes, which help them achieve even more anonymity here in the city. The insect resistance is a rapidly growing movement. Recently, three million insects took part in a biodiversity demonstration outside the London Stock Exchange to protest against the installation of beehives on its roof. The insects were not protesting against the hives, but the hypocrisy behind the kind of corporate social responsibility that superficially points towards supporting biodiversity while carrying on with a business-as-usual approach, while killing our planet through continued investment in unsustainable business. The insects saw putting hives on the roof of the London Stock Exchange as a cheap publicity stunt. They wanted fundamental change. The demonstration was described in the local press as an infestation. If only the journalist had brought a magnifying glass with her, she would have seen millions of flies with placards that read, flies against ecocide, grasshoppers against greenwash. And she would have been seen bees carrying hand-painted signs saying, make honey, not money. A more conspicuously revered city population is to be found in the elevated statues of famous men looking down on passers-by. Nearly all the public statues of important figures here are of white men. There are few ethnic minorities or women of distinction memorialised, apart from queens and allegorical female forms such as Britannia, Venus and Justice. While semi-naked women look out dreamily from porticos on the tops of buildings, their male counterparts are sitting, standing and riding above the heads of passers-by, wearing cloaks, wigs and hats. They carry impressive titles such as Duke, Sir, Lord and King. I recently came across the infamous statue of Margaret Thatcher, Britain's first female Prime Minister and Conservative Party leader, in the Guildhall Art Gallery. The larger-than-life white marble stat statue of Thatcher was decapitated by Paul Kelleher in 2002. It is now housed in a perspex box to prevent further attacks. Insects, cleaners and statues populate the early morning city. Statues occupy space as the dead made visible, while cleaners are giving supporting roles as the invisible living. I begin to take photographs of doorways, bins, street corners, shops and flowers. Immediately I'm followed into an alleyway. Is he a security guard? My heart beats fast. I need to get out of the labyrinth as quickly as I can. I'm reminded that this is a state within a state with its own police force, its own mayor, and where business is its king and everything I can see around me belongs to someone else. 
The city waits for 300,000 workers to horizontally and vertically fill its offices, shops, bars, libraries, cafes, and streets. I wait for the deadening silence, emptiness, and quiet to end. So what's interesting about this encounter with taking photographs is that actually a lot of the things I do, that's the only thing that you often get stopped for, is taking photographs. It's the one thing that people say you can't do. Um, and uh, I'll show you some of the bank rubbings in a minute, but those bank rubbings are, are a kind of form of photography, but they enable me to kind of get round that problem of actually not being able to photograph any of these places that I'm looking at. Um, just sort of like moving that idea of performance on, um, I uh, performed a chapter from uh, Common at the Barbican Theatre in 2000 and I can't remember, 13, there you go. Um, and um, I just wanted to show this kind of idea of this kind of move between kind of performance, how uh, performance in the book gets translated into a, into a kind of theatrical um, space. The Barbican Theatre itself is part of the Barbican Complex, uh, which also feels like a public space, but isn't. Um, it's owned and run by the City of London Corporation, and its sponsors include many banks, including Merrill Lynch um, and other banks from the city. So um, I adapted uh, the Crisis Cabaret um, uh, uh, for stage, and in the Crisis Cabaret, uh, the, there are two acts. One is Bonus the Banker Clown, and the other is Boom and Bust, a female comedy duo. And Boom and Bust are a very complicated act, so I couldn't really reconstruct that. So um, I decided to include a, uh, a group, an uh, all-female dance troupe called Loose Change. And they performed a Busby Barclay-style dance to um, a John Cage-style soundtrack performed by Steve Beresford on a grand piano. Um, and they're, where they're using giant riot, riot shield-sized pennies uh, that were made by artist Cat Phillips for this march, the March for the Alternative, in 2010. And here we are as the pennies on the march in Trafalgar Square. So in one of the stories in Common, I become a bank robber. Um, and uh, from 2012 to 14, I made a series of rubbings of the fronts of banks in the city of London. And these rubbings are done on envelopes. They're done on the uh, very things that the ban banks send us information about our finances in, uh, ripped open and used as paper to kind of uh, imprint the uh, unconscious of the bank back onto, uh, uh, onto these. Um, so I'm just going to show you some of these and run through them. So this is the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank of England on Prince's Street, the Cooperative Bank, Cheapside, Arid Bank, Lombard Street, BBVA Bank, Cannon Street, Barclays Bank, Fleet Street. Um, and just very briefly to say about those, uh, those uh, rubbings of the banks, is that what was very interesting in doing them, I could only ever do them at the weekends, because if I ever made them during the week, I would be stopped uh, uh, by either kind of, well, the security of the bank that I was rubbing. And um, I was rubbing, but I wasn't robbing the bank. I was just rubbing it. So, um, But I always had a kind of uh, um, a story up my sleeve for if I got stopped, which was that I was doing an architectural project where I was documenting surfaces in the city of London. So, um, and then generally people said, you can finish off, but do move on after you've done it. Uh, but what's very interesting about this is that I kind of not only document the surfaces of the banks, but also the banks that are in the city of London, where they are. Um, and they're not just the high street banks that we know. There's a kind of a global um, representation of banks in that space. So it was a very, very interesting exercise and project. So I'm going to finish off um, talking about uh, an art activist collective called Liberate Tate. Um, Liberate Tate were founded in 2010 after Tate censored a workshop titled Disobedience Makes History. And that workshop was being run by the Laboratory of Insurrectory Imagination who um, also um, did the, uh, or coordinated the uh, performances in the City of London, uh, the one that I showed you earlier. 
Um, workshop participants were told that they weren't allowed to do anything against the sponsors of Tate. Um, and they disobeyed this. Um, and they put the words, art, not oil, up in the top window of Tate Modern. And I think that um, having kind of, in, in my own experience of being involved in Liberate Tate, I got very involved very soon after that, is that I understand how difficult that is to do that, to make that gesture of disobedience um, in um, what is ultimately quite a kind of heavy um, institution to speak up against. The group is focused on getting Tate to drop its sponsor, BP, um, and we've got up to 300 members who take part in our performances. And we believe that um, there should be no sponsorship of cultural institutions by oil companies in a time of climate change. Um, and that Tate is giving BP a social license to operate by associating its name with this oil company. And that the oil, the sponsorship deal isn't about selling more petrol, but it's about giving BP a social license to operate within our cultural institutions. So just a little bit of background, um, and this is a bit of a blurry slide, but I just wanted to kind of pull out from that and show you a graphic that represents the oil sponsorship of the major galleries in London. And notice that they're all in London. Um, at the top of the uh, diagram there, you've got the BP art block, which includes the British Museum, the National Portrait Gallery, the Royal Opera House, and Tate Britain. And in 2011, BP continued their sponsorship of all four institutions with a £10 million deal um, over five years, which gives institutions around £500,000 per year each. At the bottom, there's a kind of picture. You can see a Shell, Shell logo and the BP logo. Um, so we see a bigger picture that also includes Shell as major sponsors of art, uh, cultural institutions in London, including the V&A, uh, South Bank Centre, Science Museum, National Theatre. Um, they've held private parties at the Barbican. Um, actually, they stopped sponsoring the classical programme at the South Bank Centre in 2013, but have made no promises not to return. So um, I just wanted to show you what that £500,000 means to Tate. What that £500,000 means is this tiny, tiny, tiny sliver here. And people often say that without uh, BP's money, Tate wouldn't be able to open its doors or it would have to start charging. And you can see there that it's 0.3% uh, of the total income. That them dropping BP won't um, stop them being able to open their doors. And if you look at how much public funding they get in relation to that, I think um, it makes it very clear. And also just to add to that mix, that Tate members collectively donated over 8 million to the Tate in 2014. So that's the bit of the background. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of our performances. This is uh, Human Cost. It was made on the first anniversary of the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, and it took place within the exhibition Single Form in the Duveen Galleries at Tate Britain. So this is the ma main entrance to Tate Britain Gallery on Millbrank, and it's, the gallery is just up the Thames. It's very close to the Houses of Parliament. The banners at the front of the gallery often display the BP logo on them, and that branding continues inside the gallery, inside the gallery for that £500,000 that we think that they get per annum. Um, the performance took place in the Duveen Gallery, so if you think back to the previous si slide, walk through that main gallery, and you enter the big Duveen Gallery. Um, and in the performance, a naked man moved to the middle of the space, um, lay down naked. Two members of Liberate Tate um, entered the um, space from these two side doors and walked very, very slowly with their veils on towards him and, and in a very kind of slow way began to pour um, this oil substitute over him. It's a mixture of sunflower oil um, and pigment. So, and then they put the canisters um, to the side of him and left. And he was there for 87 minutes, uh, the number of days that the spill lasted for. Um, and I think that in, in, in marking this anniversary, 
uh, we wanted to not only kind of draw attention to the ecological disaster um, that was happening in the Gulf of Mexico, but also to the human cost of that disaster in which 11 men uh, died. So uh, security guards and attendants at Tate have always experienced many more of our performances than the upper management. Um, and on that day, we had heard from a mole. Uh, we have a mole in Liberate Tate who works in Tate, who told us that, um, uh, that the security would be searching bags on that day. So there was no way that we could get uh, oil substitute into the gallery. So our mole smuggled the oil in for us the day before. And uh, one of Liberate Tate met her in the toilets, in the ladies' toilets, um, and picked up the oil and deposited in these canisters, and then we made the performance, uh, which was then cordoned off by security. But uh, a kind of maybe an interesting aside in relation to that is that um, the public, in relation to these performances, it kind of operates on many different levels. So the publics um, might be people that happen to be at Tate as these performances are happening. Um, they don't necessarily know entirely what's happening, but they can see in front of their eyes that something is happening. Maybe they don't have a kind of sense of what the context is for it. Um, and they often think that these, these performances are being um, uh, produced by the Tate. Um, so, so conversations might arise around that. Um, then the other publics for these performances are distributed, really, on the internet, on, through social media, on the news. Uh, this performance, for example, was, uh, was also uh, on Channel 4 News. It was represented on Have I Got News For You? Um, and it's been a very iconic image that's been distributed globally. Um, with the performances, uh, videos are made um, often on the day of the performance, and they'll be um, put online by that evening, so people can see uh, the work that's going on. So this is just to show you the context in which the, the performance took place in this uh, exhibition called uh, Single Form, where all the figures are kind of standing, but our figure is lying deathly on the floor. Um, this is a chronological hang, and we also saw our work as being in a chronology, and the chronology was in relation to the Gulf of Mexico oil spill. So yes, yeah, so to just go back to that idea of it becoming an iconic image, this was the image uh, that then was distributed uh, through uh, social media and online. And part of what we do is we uh, try and share this uh, as broadly as possible online so that it's not repressed, it's not stopped, it's not kind of uh, um, stopped from uh, being distributed. If you do an image search for Tate and BP, um, this is something like, you might return something like this an image stream that's been polluted by our images um, in relation to uh, um, uh, the sponsorship. <coughs> so in 2012, we decided to do something big, something really big. We wanted to give a 1.5 meter, 1.5 ton, 16 meter long wind turbine blade to the Tate. So uh, we decided that we would choose the Tate Modern Turbine Hall the site of the former oil-fired oil Bankside power station as the place that we wanted to install um, our wind turbine play, play, uh, blade. Uh, the perfect place for a discussion about future energy, energy provision beyond oil. Um, so a Welsh farmer donated us a blade, and here it is in a field in Wales. Uh, it was then cut into three pieces and transported on the back of a lorry uh, to central London, where it was stored in a warehouse, actually on the outskirts of London, um, and where we cleaned it and rehearsed and worked out its mechanisms for uh, fitting it together. On the day of the performance, we, uh, we had made an open call a few weeks before, um, and on the day, people were notified that they should meet on the steps of St Paul's um, at a certain time. I can't remember exactly what time that was. Um, and we were there in our veils so people knew where to come. And we carried a small part of the blade over the Millennium Bridge to the Tate. But um, this was a decoy. So uh, every, everyone meeting at St Paul's was a decoy. 
And meantime, the large end of the blade was coming in round the back of uh, Tate Modern. Um, and we managed to get the blade in to the building and then snake it down, very slowly down that ramp because we didn't want to lose control of it. This is one and a half tons of uh, 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 wind turbine blade. And we installed it at the bottom um, of, the, um, of the ramp there. Um, with groups of people working to fit it together and another group of people who formed a human cordon around, around it. Um, what is often amazing about these performances at Tate, they are amazing. <laughs> to be involved with them is, um, is quite amazing. Something happens in that space uh, when we're there. Um, oh, sorry, I feel very emotional, but at the end of this, I remember we looked up and then suddenly, there were like hundreds of people. And the people were all over the balconies, all around that Tate Modern Turbine Hall. And we looked up, and then there was this massive peal of clapping as we installed uh, the turbine blade at the bottom of the um, turbine hall. So we gave the blade to the Tate under the Museum and Galleries Act. Uh, and it's an act where people can give artwork to the Tate um, and we gave them this gift of renewable energy, uh, which we had installed for them in the Tate Modern Turbine Hall. Um, and we gifted them the ready-made turbine blade alongside documentation of the work, which included uh, photos, a text, and videos. Um, and the purpose for this was kind of not only to have this kind of uh, external, kind of to foster external debate, about, um, about its sponsor and about energy provision, but also to put internal pressure on the Tate, that they actually had to then discuss this work. They did reject the gift. Um, it was kind of, uh, the wind turbine blade was stored in um, one of their warehouses on the outside of London, um, and eventually it went back to Wales, and our photos are now in their archive. Um, so I just very, very quickly finish with one more performance. Um, this performance, Parts Per Million, was, uh, took place in 2013. Um, and it took place in the newly chronologically rehung and renamed BP Walk Through British Art at the galleries in Tate Britain. Remember that figure? We don't know exactly what it is, but we think it's £500,000. So BP gets to name the whole of the collection of British art for that figure. So the performance took place at the official public reopening of the newly renovated Tate Britain. And that was Saturday the 23rd of November 2013. And it was something that Tate unfortunately advertised as a housewarming party. And this was a very unfortunate use of language because it was a housewarming party that occurred in the same week that data on anthropogenic global warming emissions showed that Tate sponsor BP was one of the companies most responsible for climate change. In parts per million, 50 veiled figures walked through the galleries, reading out the parts per million in the atmosphere in each room. So this is our route. Um, and we started, uh, I think we, we gathered here 50 of us gathered here. And then we walked through to the 1840 room where we started our count. And we started our count in the 1840 room because that's when the Industrial Revolution began to significantly impact emission levels in the atmosphere. Um, and, um, yeah, so we passed through. We kept walking. And we passed through something, which is the 350 parts per million value, um, and that was in the 70s or the 80s, and now we're in 400 parts per million, which is uh, the current kind of uh, um, where we are now. We carried with us uh, small books that had diagrams in them, these diagrams that you can see here. And in the diagrams, uh, you can see that they kind of act as, op uh, act as instructions for us. So um, this room here, for example, people would have been dotted around the room, and they would have counted from 307 to 308. 
Um, have I got five minutes, Ben? Or okay. So I'm just going to end on some of the most current work um, and to talk about another sphere of Tate's accountability, um, public accountability being challenged. Um, and this is being challenged through a number of freedom of information requests. And these freedom of information requests have been made um, around various issues, uh, one of which was uh, to ask the Tate to disclose the amount of money that it receives from BP. Um, and the other one was um, a, uh, an account of the Tate Ethics Committee deliberation of its relationship with BP. And so that was asked for as a freedom of information request and um, was received, but it was very, very heavily redacted. It was almost impossible to see what was happening. So Tate had refused a number of freedom of information requests to reveal that amount of money um, and, to, um, um, and what was in its committee meeting minutes. So Liberate Tate performed hidden figures days before Tate was due to appear at the Royal Courts of Justice in London um, at an information tribunal called by the Information Commissioner following those freedom of information requests. Um, and the performance was made during the Malevich exhibition. His black square painting was on show um, in the galleries above. Um, and we wanted to do something to highlight the issue of redaction and the redaction of information uh, from the freedom of information request. And the black square seemed like a kind of perfect <laughs> image to call upon in relation to this and to make that link between uh, um, Malevich um, and the revolutionary exhibition that the Tate was putting on um, and our own, um, our own uh, endeavours to try and get to reveal these amounts of money. So uh, 100 people um, held this square of cloth here while other people, um, including children and again another kind of way of thinking around public, uh, public enjoying these arts, works of art, um, played underneath and were literal hidden figures underneath it. And the performance lasted for two hours. So just to finish with the most final, the, the kind of, the most recent performance, on the 27th of January 2015, the judge ruled that Tate should reveal the BP sponsorship figures for, from 1990 until 2006, so not the current ones. Uh, but it, and it was also told to publish the redacted minutes from the Tate Ethics Committee meeting. So the amount of money given to Tate by BP between 1990 and 2006 was an average of 224,000 per year, um, a very, very slender amount in relation to the Tate's overall budget. And on the 31st of January 2015, we threw 224,000 pounds worth of fake money from the balcony of the Tate members' room at Tate Britain down into the rotunda. Thank you very much. <laughs> Time for a couple of questions, if there are any. sympathetic to us and to what we're trying to say. Um, 
and uh, I think can can understand from their various backgrounds the politics of what's happening with the land rights in different countries, for example, through the operation of the So they're not, uh, they're not, uh, they are, we, we don't have any formal communication with them, um, but as we understand it, they're very sympathetic. Uh, often when, um, I think when uh, the last incident that we did there when we left the building, for example, um, security smiled and said, have a very nice day, it was very nice. Uh, we have contact with um, with uh, people who work at Hay through the PPM union. So there are it's um, there are different. You know, we we're very aware of what the impact is of what we do on the people who work there. Um, that it's not necessary uh, that upper management aren't kind of dealing with it on the on the shop floor, so to speak. But we're very very polite. We are non-confrontational and we always talk people through what's happening as it's happening to, to minimise any form of anxiety. Earlier on, we had funding from Artist Project Earth, um, uh, and <coughs> now we kind of manage on our own. So by doing talks and presentations, and we just gather all that money, and 100 pounds goes in, and then and, and and so forth. So we don't have a lot of money, but we have enough to be able to do what we want to do, and we work with with the means that we have, um, and a lot of support and goodwill by everyone else that. And I found your work amazing, and it does highlight too many uh, problems in our society. Uh, do you uh, think that um, uh, you have a, a, a school that you really uh, want it? Do you not want to work it? So, uh, not to be so young, so the people that are around, or you know, um, within the art. Direct. 
in, in the way that a kind of protest might be normally conceived. Um, so the veil might mean very different things, like uh, one of which is a motion of grief for loss of, of what? Of our world, actually. Um, but the other thing is for anonymity. So the, the anonymity of the prison type, for example, where uh, people can um, take part in the performances, but there's a kind of often a sense of uh, protection. So, for example, in um, Parks and Minions, there were 50 people there, some of whom had ever done anything like that before. And I think that the veil offers this kind of uh, extra divide between ourselves and security, for example, that then say we're performing, we're in this space, and leave us to be in this space. So I think that, that it has lots of different functions. Oh, and there's Darren at the back. And there's Darren at the back who's a member of the great team. We've got time for one more question. Okay. Um, I, I, I think there's a sort of, a sort of a sort of dialectic suppose we have here about forms these days and how it's changed since the seventies uh, um, to some degree. I mean, it, 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 I suppose I, I'm I'm brought up in in a world where I do art to discover the reasons for what I'm making. Whereas in this case, you, you very clearly have a beast in view. It, and and, uh, and, and, uh, and it, it, in a sense, the, the message is already in your mind before you make it. How do you, as an artist who did work that was very different to sound earlier, how do you feel about that? So I still do, I still operate in both ways. So I still have the a kind of practice where I work without knowing what I'm doing. And Takes very long time to bring things into consciousness, and I let those things kind of come in in different ways. So I have, it's, um, but I think that uh, that's also not to say that in the great in the group we're not making things up as we go along. We have to each time we reach another stage, another impact, we have to kind of be very creative and look at what we need to do in that situation to move forward, move something forward, or to make another argument, or to put something else into the mix. So I think there's a very, uh, it is very, it is very creative within, within what we're doing. So we have an aim, uh, but within that, actually, there, you know, we're using quite emergent processes to, for us to actually understand what we're doing. And sometimes it might take a year to fully understand the performance, to start beginning to talk about it and then for a year for it to actually come around to start to it. And that's not just the logistics, that's really about working through the ideas. If I could just off offer a little kind of comment there as well. One of the aspects we're trying to understand in this, you're absolutely right, it's much more, it seems like it's much more strategic, coordinated, we have an idea, how can we, ex we express it? But actually, there's also a much wider collective consciousness around this, around society trying to understand what's happening actually around it's, it's the way it's living. And so we really feel that we're you know, trying to find ways to explore these deeper questions of how do we live as a society and how do we shape change. So that, that, that is a very important question as well. Um, but thank you very much and um,